and going. So I'm here with Shay Downey. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Shay, she is um, a school advocate who I have been working closely with the last, um, I don't know, a couple of months. And I have her on once a month to talk about school advocacy, school advocacy um, questions and topics. And now we are in kind of a whole new world. So let us know, like, um, what are some of the struggles that you're having as you are bringing your kiddos home? Because we are now in this kind of a unique um, situation with uh, with our kids all coming home, um, and you know, across the across the world, actually, kids are coming home. Parents are expected to kind of be their homeschooling front. Um, or their homeschooling guides, if you will. So anyway, I want to welcome Shay. Um, welcome. How are you today? Yes, I'm doing well, thanks. Um, and happy to be here. I know we we kind of talked about what how do how do we proceed? We've we've had plans of talks planned out for a while. Like each month, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then um, the whole world was thrown a curveball. So. Uh, we kind of just um, last minute switched it up a little bit and really want to be here to answer your questions, give you some tips on um, one, if your students had any special uh, behavior plans in place or a 504 or an IEP, what does that mean for your child now as far as uh, virtual schooling goes? Um, how will those needs be serviced and met in that, that world? Um, as well as the new dynamic that's going on in your home, which is that um, many, many parents are transitioning from just mom and dad to uh, mom, dad, and teacher. And um, when we're not used to being with our kids all day long, every day, in a structured environment, such as the summertime, you know, it's kind of let them sleep when they want, we get up, you know, it, it, it's less structured than school time. And so now um, that is changing and it will cause uh, a change in the dynamic in your home. So we want to talk to you about that and support you with how you can make that smooth. That's exactly right. And I think one of the other things about the difference between right now, which is so obvious, the difference between right now and summertime is um, you can actually go places with your children. In the summertime. Exactly. Exactly. You can do things. And now... Up here. Yeah. So um, why don't we jump right into it, um, Shay? Why don't you tell us a little bit about what your, the first thing that you described. Yeah. Now that so, you, know, you have kids who have needs, mm -hmm. you have kids who have certain things in their eyes. Yeah, so so lots and lots of questions are, are coming my way. Um, and I'll, I'll be really honest with you. It, it's uncharted territory of how, how this is, is going to work. Um, I know that in Florida and in many states that the school district is doing its absolute best, school districts and states are doing their absolute best to um, conduct anything that they can virtually, virtually. So um, if you are, if your child receives speech services, a lot of our speech therapists are hopping into Zoom and trying to work on um, those types of services while the kiddos are at home. And so obviously um, patience needs to be uh, implemented at its highest degree right now because um, they're trying to schedule that and work that out and get in touch with all of the parents and who has internet and who doesn't have internet and who has computer access and all of those things are going on. Um, I know that there was a big thing floating around Facebook that uh, the federal government was going to um, halt the IDEA law for a year, meaning that um, all testing, all, uh, all IEPs, all of that, all of your procedural safeguards and rights would essentially be on hold for one um, calendar year. That has been discussed, but has not been finalized. There's a, so, so when you see that on Facebook, know that that is, is being talked about on how they're going to handle that and how they're going to, how the federal government is going to address it. But that has not been of top concern 
right now, obviously. So, um, so that being said, as far as like what's going on in your district, every district is trying to handle this to the best of their ability. The one thing I can tell you is if your child has certain accommodations that we've discussed before, the difference between services and accommodations, um, those accommodations still need to be taking place online virtually. So if your student is provided a test, that they have to take online and they are supposed to get extra time and that test is in fact time, um, then that they should be given extra time. They There are ways in, in whatever platforms that they are using to extend the time on the test. So, you know, that those are things that, that definitely should still be happening. If it's possible for it to still continue and take place online, then it continues to take place. Okay, I wanted to go back to, to kind of some of the, the rumor mill around the suspension of the IDEA because um, I just want to give parents a little bit of understanding about what that means. Okay. Um, and I'm no, not definitely I, your domain. <laughs> I will know. I've seen headlines, right? But just from a matter, of, I want people to understand this from a matter of how the federal laws and the state laws work. So let's say the federal government decided to suspend the IDEA and say, you know, we don't need to provide these services for a year. We need to suspend these particular um, safeguards for a year because schools can't do that online, whatever. Your state can still decide to meet all of those regulations. Your state does not have to follow suit. So what happens is the federal government sets the lowest bar. It mm -hmm. sets the low bar that states have to meet. And every state gets to decide, are we going to meet that bar or are we going to give more rights to parents? Are we going to give, are we going to meet the needs of parents? And so just if you hear that, pay more attention to what's happening mm -hmm. in a particular state than at the federal level. Um, so just giving people kind of an idea, mm -hmm. like just because it happens at the federal level does not necessarily mean your state will stop providing those services. Right, right. It, it basically provides protection for, you know, there to be um, no lawsuits, really. That's, that's the bottom line is to say, during this time, we understand that um, we have extenuating circumstances. And for that reason, we are, we are going to not hold um, all states accountable for at the same level, but that still has not been 100% decided either. So as of right now, everything is in place. Um, these are big questions. So I just want to address a couple, some, some of the main questions that I'm getting like from like emails, like, well, my child was supposed to be tested. What's going to happen? They're, you know, they're on the list. Um, every single district that I have called and talked to is doing something different. There's like some, you know, some are saying we are continuing with testing. We are contacting the family, the school psychologist um, and the family sign a consent that they are understanding that they are going to be socially contacted face to face with these these kids. And uh, if you want to continue with testing, they are agreeing that you can if you sign a waiver saying if my child gets sick from doing this, I took that risk and I was I, I'm OK with it. Um, I know in, in uh, some others, they are saying, no, we're having zero contact. We're not making any decisions on anything. Everything has been put on hold until April 15th. And we'll deal with, you know, until at least April 15th. And we'll deal with those consequences as they come about. Um, so it, you really have to, if you were on that list to get tested by your school district, you really need to reach out to them and ask what their their plan of action is going to be. And think about really think about what is is important right now for for moving forward with that um it's it's de this this whole situation is definitely going to open up a completely different realm for those of us um, working towards getting students needs met um, through IDEA for sure uh, and so I I want to just tell you you know um, now kind of the time to be a little bit patient, but aware and alert and not just throw it out the window and forget it, but uh, to understand that, you know, the law is a little, I, I kind of compare it to, I heard it, this thing on the radio the other day that was like, you can pick up your, your food from 
a restaurant and they'll bring you your martini and margarita or Bloody Mary t- as well. And I was like, what? <laughs> Suddenly now we can deliver alcohol to someone's car. Like, <laughs> you know, so now um, we don't yeah. have to serve as kids in the classroom, you know. So um, as far as uh, if you're like, if your kiddos were seeing, um, two teachers in the classroom. Let's just say, for example, that their IEP. Um, and if we have any questions popping up, Aaron, yeah. just let me know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So if your your kiddo is receiving um, intervention services or they were receiving, um, say their IEP indicates that they have a certain number of minutes of instruction from a, a, an ESE teacher, a certified special education teacher, uh, those teachers should be providing work for your students on their level in in terms of the intervention um, to the best of their ability um, in a virtual format. However your school is handling that. Erin and I were talking about it. I know of a school district in New Jersey. They were on board. They had started. They, the, they went Friday was the last day of face to face. And by that following Monday, all kids were working online because that's how their system was already set up. Um, where I am in Florida and Lee County, it was, um, we were already on spring break. And so then we had a week, this week right here is to give teachers a chance to prepare and put all of those things online. And those ESC teachers are being required to create a class in Google Classroom whatever other platform schools may be using. It could, could be Canvas, it could be um, Moodle. I mean, there's a lot of them that that schools could use, but they should be creating classes for your students. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that should be taking place and it shouldn't, really shouldn't be an extenuating amount of time. Um, but a reasonable, we have to be reasonable with the idea of, of what everyone is going through at, at this moment. Yeah, I think, you know, every district has had different Mm -hmm. levels of funding and and different um, Mm -hmm. different abilities to get to be prepared for this. And the fact is they weren't legally required to be prepared for this type of situation. And so for those of us who find ourselves in in districts where where we're lucky enough that they were ready. Right. Mm -hmm. um, That that's a little bit easier than those districts yeah. lagging behind. Um, but yeah, I would say, so Shay, if I'm taking from what, what you're saying, I, I think what you're saying is, A, unprecedented time sometimes requires patience. Mm-hmm. Stay aware, yeah. stay in communication um, with your school district about the needs mm-hmm. that your child has and the services they were getting and how they may. So like, for example, a social group, if your child, if your right. child was entitled to a social group at school, um, you know, will that teacher be now meeting via Zoom with those students as a group? Will they be meeting one on one? Like, how is that child going to receive receive that particular service? Is that? Is yes. That, is yeah, that? exactly. And, and to accept the answer that it may not happen right away, or or at all for the next few weeks just because it it's a you know we don't know what we don't know are we going to go back to school in two weeks uh some states have said not for the rest of the the year um and what does that mean for next year there's there i feel certain and this is only my opinion and just speculation so please please understand that my my speculation is that districts will be relieved of responsibility um, for a lot of the services that they're currently offering for the rest of the school year if they have chosen to to cancel school. Um, I don't necessarily know that I believe that that's the best way. I'm always a you know think outside the box, figure it out, find out ways to meet those needs as best that we can. But I, I feel certain that there will be some um, relief given to school districts for that. So that being said, those of you, and I'm going to say a topic here that, that you can look up later if you want, but there's something called compensatory education. And it means when students have not been given the services that they need and that, that 
uh, they've been assessed and proven that they need in the time frame that they were supposed to get it, uh, parents can file for due process. They can ask for compensatory education, which means that they are either awarded additional time above and beyond what they're already getting or money to pay private outsourced uh, people to provide those services. And um, I, I feel confident in saying that that's probably going to be something that a lot of people are going to push for. Um, it's going to cause a lot of uh, a lot of backlog of things, and likely will not be awarded um, from just the the people that I've talked to over other advocates and um, in other situations in the past that this has happened. Yeah. Not this exact thing, no, but this simil you know, similar. <laughs> this has never happened, but there have been times where like hurricanes, for example, in Florida, we've, we've had schools shut down for an extended period of time due to hurricane damage. And um, we know, you know, how that is the only precedent that we have to account for, for the law um, and how to proceed. So, and that's how laws and that's how judgments are made based on prior situations. Yeah. So, and you know, yeah. so so, too, is not just about the school readiness, but is also about the yeah. parent and home readiness. And I think this might yeah. be a good time to kind of segue yep, in, I agree. into our next topic, which is um, how do we, how do parents support their children at home um, when they've got kiddos who, you know, in this group, we're all talking about ADHD. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of parents say, oh my gosh, I never knew <laughs> what my child yeah like in school until I started trying to be his teacher. And now I feel so bad for that teacher. Like, I'm <laughs> of that. yeah, yeah. So trying to figure out how do we support our children at home when they have these special skills and special needs. And, um, and so if any of you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments, because um, these are topics that, that, you know, um, both Shay and I can kind of answer for you. Yeah. Um, but thoughts you have about that. And, yeah. And so I, I typically have a list of, of, you know, five basic tips that I sort of give to parents to, to, they're not the be all end all, but they're sort of to live by and, and to, to understand. And the first one, um, I always like to start with is like, cut yourself some slack and your kiddo, because this is new and different. And I promise that if you miss one day of instruction or one hour, or one assignment, or even the next nine weeks that are left in this school year, it will be okay. Your your kiddos will be okay. This is, um, you know, the the academic part of it is not our life or death year. Um, so that does not mean to just throw your hands up in the air and say, forget it, we're not going to do anything. It just means to um, to take it in stride every day, to know that it's new, look at it as an opportunity to learn about your child, learn about yourself, um, you know, and when the going gets tough, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to say, all right, I, this is, this is not the time. Um, there's, you know, we, we don't learn during frustration. It, that's never going to happen. Um, One so, of the yeah. I'm noticing with parents is mm -hmm. that they are putting, and I say they, me included, but um, yeah. a lot of parents are putting more expectations on them and their child mm -hmm. than school does. So if yes. a and has a ton of like, we're going to learn for this short amount of time and then we're going to move, mm -hmm. whether it's just we're going to move rooms, we're going to go to gym, right. we're going to go to recess, we're going to have lunch, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. or we're just going to move yeah. tables. Like, and moving is not the yeah. example, but, you know, we're going to learn for 30 minutes and then we're going to move for a significant amount of time. Yeah. And it most, a lot of parents that I'm talking to have schedules that are completely unreal. Right. Yeah. And I talk about that. That's, that's one of my next tips. Oh, so sorry, one sorry. thing I just want to, that's okay. No, 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 it's okay. I want to interject here really quick that, um, you know, one of the things I'm noticing, and I, I've, I've actually not been one of the education people doing this because I feel very, um, I feel, I feel very deeply about the fact that the more that we're putting out into social media, and I know a lot of education people are just trying to help, and they're like, 
oh, here's this great homeschool idea, and here's this great homeschool idea, and here's this free resource and that free resource, and you know, look at my schedule. There, you know, parents like, oh, look at where, what we're doing. Look at my school room. Look at that school room, and it, it's overwhelming mm-hmm. for it's overwhelming for me. And I'm an educator, and when it when it's all coming into me. When I'm looking at it and trying to decipher, are these resources actually good resources? Are they fluff resources? Um, and I just, I start to have a lot of compassion for parents out there that are thinking, I'm behind, I'm behind. You know, all these families have all these cute rooms, but they're doing homeschool and, and, and that's okay. that, be perfect. And I'm like a, shit yeah, ball. yes. And, <laughs> and I have, yeah, and I have to, you know, sort through all of these resources and, it, it's it's unnecessary, you know, keep it simple, cut yourself some slack. And um, you don't have to be, you know, the, the Instagram homeschool mom. <laughs> That's, you know, like I, I just and so I, it, I hadn't been very vocal on social media about uh, do this, do that, you know, um, just because I, I think there's so much out there that uh, I, I wish we could all just pull back for a little bit and settle and kind of kind of sit at rest and in peace for a little bit and just observe what our kids are doing at home and what they need to be learning and um, and not overwhelm everything. Ever overwhelm yourself. If you feel overwhelmed, I can assure you, you are going to push that energy onto your children. And what's going to happen after that is they are going to melt down and you're going to have behavior problems and you're going to have a whole mess of storm on your hand. Right. So. That's why my first tip is cut yourself some slack. Keep it simple. Awesome. You know, this is not this is this is not a time to have to worry about being you know the perfect homeschool mom or dad or family. Right. And then next after that um, is a schedule. So it is important, and especially for ADHD kiddos, to have a set routine and schedule. They like to know. Um, what is going to happen next? One of the big things we talk about is to offer transition warnings to kids who are, um, I mean, their brain is already going a million miles an hour and now you're gonna throw something out there to them. Okay, now we're changing to this, now we're doing that, now we're moving here. And so we've talked about that here before, I know, and I've I've read multiple times of, you know, giving kids that that transition uh, warning. So that ties right into schedule. Um, and to be aware, every child is a little bit different. Yes, we can have this, this uh, sample schedule. So, you know, if you get up at eight o'clock in the morning and you have breakfast and then you do language arts and then you do your math and you do this for this amount of time and this for that amount of time. Um, I encourage families to be consistent but reasonable and play with it a little bit because this is a time where um, your your kiddos should actually thrive because they're not being shoved into that box in a traditional classroom. So don't shove them in the box at home. Oh my gosh, Um, Shay, that's like a brilliant, (laughs) like seriously, like that is perfect. Like school can't provide them so many of our kids what they mm-hmm. and so why are so many parents trying to replicate yeah. something that's not that's working at home that's exactly i'm seeing schedule posted after schedule posted after schedule posted and i'm looking at it and i'm thinking oh my goodness this is a kindergartner i want to reach out to this person and say why do you have them sitting for story time for 45 minutes they can't sit for dinner for 45 minutes and they're actually doing something while they're eating. What makes you think they're going to sit and do their story time for re you know, just because somebody saw that schedule online, it's, it's, right. uh, it's unrealistic. And a lot of your kiddos um, are going to be struggling with their environment because they're home and it's, that's not the place they're used to doing school work. And, you know, they're so, you're going to have to switch it up. And this is a time, like I said before, to kind of figure out your kiddos. I know. And one of the things I've learned over, over my lifetime is what my peak work hours are. So I'm not a morning person. I mean, there's a reason that Aaron and I choose to do our lives, but like <laughs> the times that we do, right? Because I know when my peak brain time is, um, 
I like to get up in the morning. I like to have my quiet time. I like to process and think about my day. And then by 930, I'm, I'm on fire. Like I'm on fire from like nine to four, you know, and by four o'clock, I'm ready to go to the gym. I'm ready to start winding down. So I plan my life like that. When do I need to do the most important thing? This is a time to learn that about your child. Mm-hmm. And Some for kiddos them, about themselves. And for them, them to learn that about themselves. Yes, because it's very, very important to uh, to your life. And and you as parents will have to navigate, okay, this is my peak time and this is my child's peak time. And how are we going to integrate these two into a schedule so that we can get done what we need to get done and um and and be yes and be uh uh, productive and be healthy, like we're saying mental health and be, um, you know, uh, efficient in what we're doing with while avoiding, um, I don't really like the term avoiding, but um, managing any type of meltdowns that might take place. When your child's having a meltdown, it's, there's a trigger. There's no question about it. The schedule's too rigorous. The school's too rigorous. Your energy is causing them to feel anxious. There's, there's so many different things that could be going on. But back to schedule, keep it consistent as possible, but not rigid. I don't, uh, I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense, Erin? Like consistent in, in, you can't just not do work today and do work tomorrow and, oh, we'll get to it later, that kind of thing. Because it is important for them to be doing the schoolwork, but don't feel like because your neighbor started at 8 a.m. that you have to start at 8 a.m. Or because... The standard time for math is 50 minutes doesn't mean you have to spend 50 minutes. Right. It could be 15 or you might go for a scavenger hunt and decide yes. that you're having so much fun that you're going to skip, yes. you know, the next, right. Project or the next thing that you had, like, let's, let's push that tomorrow because we're really enjoying this right. thing, you know, that right. so when I say, yeah. So when I say consistent, I mean, you have to keep them in the idea that, academics and learning is going to continue on a daily basis, but, um, and that it, and, and you you keep that, uh, environment, that concept mindset in your home. Um, but not that it has to be rigid of eight and then at nine o'clock we're doing this and at 10 o'clock we're doing this and, and, and worry about checking that time clock box. The thing, the one thing, and I think this is a whole different topic, so I only want to talk okay. for a second, but the one thing okay. that- do really encourage parents to find very well and I let I because kids with ADHD are so much more visual Mm -hmm. I really encourage parents to do some sort of a visual calendar but the one Mm -hmm. thing I find that kids really need to understand what are my firm stop and start times are the things like screen time that parents are really trying to control around Mm -hmm. so that kids understand like my start and stop time on screens is this and my start and stop time you know in the afternoon is this and then sticking to that so that they aren't kind of bleeding all over the place and you're right. not in the screen time battle constantly all day. Yeah. That's a totally other yeah. topic. Though. Yeah. Um, and that's and to tie up, yeah. To tie along with that a little bit. Um, one of the things that I like to kind of interject, I typically just say schedule. And then if anybody wants to talk to me individually about how to set up the schedule in their home or what, you know, I, I work with that family and determine what works best for that family. I, I've done that for homeschool families for years. Um, so, but one thing I do always like to say is it, you should have a checklist of what does need to get done in like your top priorities for that day and the priorities for that week and involve your child in that because they will let you know. They they will tell you. It's the, the children are not typically battling against doing things. They're battling against the rigid r- rigidness of it, I guess, the rigidity, I guess is the word. Um, the, the, I have to do this now. I have to do it in this time. I don't understand. It's hard. It's frustrating. Um, and I'm in this time frame for it. Mm-hmm. So that's where just like as adults, that's where any kind of frustration can come in. So having a checklist of what needs to be done is great and involving your child with that as part of your schedule. Um, so, so that they are learning some organization of getting things done, but um, to understand that there can be flexibility as well. One of the things I do when, when we do that exercise, we do it every day mm-hmm. at home is we have a family meeting and my kids are sometimes like, mom, really? It's the same thing tomorrow. 
<laughs> but um, we have the family meeting and I call it our have to and need or our have to's and want to's because I want to teach my yeah. children that we do have to prioritize our have mm -hmm. to's, like taking a shower and getting our math done and those kinds of things. But we also have to prioritize our want to's mm -hmm. because there's always going to be so many things to do in a day. We're not going to get them all done. And we have to, we don't always have to have everything finished before we right. experience joy. And so like yeah. if your want to is take the dog for a walk because that's fun for your kid or whatever, mm -hmm. maybe that goes before math, you know, yeah. and so they can see how their want to's get filled in in the day of like where where will this want to fit? Where will your hour of FaceTime or half an hour of FaceTime with your cousin fit, you know, today? Because we're going to make that a priority and it makes them a little bit more like, oh, OK, I can do my yeah. math after that. I get to do this thing. I right. want. Yeah. And and it's um, that is what I mean by consistency, your daily, daily meeting. They know that that is going to happen and they know that um, that it serves a purpose, a good purpose for them, a positive purpose for them. Yeah, they get to have um, that voice. So this is yeah. what I want to do. Yeah. Today. Mm -hmm. OK, well, here, yeah. what are the things we need to do? And it also that's just a great exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Going through in their mind. Okay, yeah. well, and if it's not something that you've implemented already. It's something you can implement now and carry it on from this point forward. So there are a lot of positives to us having to bring our kids home for a little while. Um, it, there, there, I mean, a, a lot. I know a lot of, I know there's a lot of negativity about it, but I really like to look at the cup in a different way and say, wow, what a really neat opportunity that this generation of, of kids and, and parents will have because yeah. of this experience. Yeah, I just re I have a, a a kid mom journal. I have three different journals and um when they are at their dad's house, I write in them and then leave them, but I have forgotten for like 2 months. We've kind of let these things go. And I just got them back out because I was like, we're going to want to look back on this time, when, yeah. you know, yeah. 10 years. What a great idea. Yeah. For now, we're going to want to say like this is what I did today and this is what was going on and it's just such a unique time. So let's move the, on. My next tip is um, space in your home. Um, you, you really need to find, it doesn't have to be a whole room that you've gone to Ikea and decorated. Like, don't worry about that. <laughs> I've seen those pictures on, on social media too. Um, it just needs to be a dedicated space that works for your child. Um, I kind of don't like it to be in the kid's bedroom. That's not typically the best environment. Uh, you know, a simple corner in your in your kitchen can be okay. Um, just a designated space that is for academics so that they understand that when I'm in this space, um, these are the expectations that are going to happen when I'm in this space. And it's uh, I, I would involve them in choosing the location. Um, I would involve them in you know, getting together some supplies that they like, something fun that they like to have there that's not necessarily a distraction, but think, okay, if my child has a band on their chair, this is a, this is a big um, accommodation that a lot of kids with ADHD have. They may have like the bouncy bands on their chair mm -hmm. uh, for their feet. Um, give them the bouncy band. Like this is, this is a time that you can see what it's like to um, apply those accommodations to you, your kids at home. And, um, you know, hopefully you all have a copy of your IEP or 504, or maybe this is a time where you're thinking, I wish they did that for my child at school and it's not happening. I'm going to try it at home and you're going to record that information so that when they do go back to school. So this is, this is a good time for uh, that space to, and to, to practice and also, you know, kind of play around with and see what works best for your child so that you can teach them some organization uh, skills you can. Because remember, we're talking about these ADHD kids that we really wish were learning these, these skills at school and they may not be. So uh, a good time for one on one for you to be teaching them and helping them with it. I love your thing about space. I see too many parents putting their kids up into their room because mm -hmm. they a quiet place with no distractions, which is so not <laughs> helpful for children with ADHD right. because yeah. their brains yeah. will find distraction and their brain will not be able to focus if right. they're not stimulated enough. So yeah. uh, 
there was actually someone in our group who was like, miraculously, I sat my child down next to me while I worked and they worked and, or, you know, while I'm cooking, they're working and somehow they're getting their work done, even though that's kind of distracting. And that's, a, it's a wonderful um, strategy yeah. called body double. Yeah. We can talk more about that another time, but um, your kid most likely should not be alone in their room trying to do their homework. No. No. And, and to, to really think about, do you want their room? What, what what do we want our room to be? I don't personally like working necessarily in my bedroom because that is my downtime. That's my quiet space. That's my relaxing, you know, so think about yourself. What, um, uh, I'll address that too. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, think about what, you want the energy to be like and the dynamic to be like in that space. Um, if your child enjoys their bedroom and that is their happy place, right? Maybe not interjecting school, which does by nature have some, um, you know, rigid feeling about it might not be the best place to interject that for them. Um, it, it should, you know, it should be a place that is just for school. And like, like Aaron said, some kids work really well with noise and distraction. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, a um, it's almost like this reverse. We think a, a kid with ADHD can have no distractions. It needs to be totally quiet. And that's not necessarily always true. Totally quiet causes their brain to go on overload and make their own distractions. Right. So, so yeah. having some noise or something else going on might be something your child needs. It doesn't mean every child. This is the time to figure out your child and to write it down because you're going to need this and use it later when you're having conferences with teachers at school who say, your child does X, Y, Z. And you can say, oh, when I had them home, this is what I did and this is what worked or this is what didn't work. And so this that. is a great time for you to start making some notes for when they do go back to school. Yeah, and, and also just remembering like, whatever is happening, whatever was mm -hmm. happening at school physically with your child, whether mm -hmm. it was frequent movement breaks, the bands, the mm -hmm. fidget hands and all of that, like that is now, if you want those things to continue, the only person who can make those continue are you. And so right. like, as much as we want the school to be responsible for that at this point in time, we have to remember that ourselves. Like I can't expect my child to sit here for 45 minutes when he was only expected to sit for 10 at a time at school, you know? So, right. and, uh, and you made a big deal about it with the school to say this is, or maybe you didn't, but then some cases we have had to make a big deal about it at school to get these services or these, that our kids to, to be understood. Don't forget that when you have them at home. Um, I did schedule, I did space, I did uh, give yourself, um, cut yourself some slack on um, preparing. Our kiddos are super creative and smart. And um, if you are not prepared ahead of time for what they're going to be doing, they are going to see that as a perfect opportunity to push all of your buttons and um, try to take over control of the entire situation. <laughs> so I, and they will. And before you know it, you both will be having meltdowns. So um, take some time to yourself and uh, prepare what you're going to to do with your your kiddos it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be perfect and you're going to have a script and you're going to be absolutely right on the money but i promise that if you can see what the school is sending you you have looked through i think uh brandy was saying that they're picking up packets from the school so prior to you having to sit you know don't sit down with your child for the first time and look at that packet. You need to spend time looking at that packet first and imagine what is this gonna be like when I give this to my child? Can they do this work? Can they do it independently? How long do I think is it, it's going to take them to do this? Um, do I understand the directions so that I can clearly explain the directions to my child if they don't understand the directions instead of figuring it out together at the same time? Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean that you don't listen to your child during during instruction because your kids can teach you a lot too uh, about it but you have to be prepared if you're not prepared they're i'm just going to be honest with you they're going to eat you alive oh i kind of touched touched on two of these together uh um i touched on um 
in your space and your schedule having expectations, but to set expectations for your kids, like uh, just like we have rules in the classroom, I don't like to call them rules just because, you know, that again has that rigid component to don't do this, don't do that. Um, but it's a time to model a positive mindset. Uh-huh. This is, you know, a lot of kind of what you were saying, Erin, about um, having that family meeting. These are our have to do's. These are our want to do's. How are we going to work in our schedule? But to set the expectation that just like for behavior, this is a this is a big one that you guys are all learning about anyway. Um, you set those behavioral expectations in your home for parenting. It's, you're going to have to have a few different ones that you pop in for the schooling time. Um, uh-huh. And uh, so you, you know, I'm like, I said, I'm happy to, to map out some of those for you of things that you could do. Um, some that I always kind of say are really important um, is, uh, you know, you want like the checklist, mm-hmm. like the have to do's and the want to do's, getting those done. Um, asking your students uh, or your kiddos to uh, communicate with you. This is, um, kind of, we call them sort of having, when we're in meetings, there's this new term that's like, what are the norms of the meeting, right? I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but kind of having these norms uh, in your your teaching time with your students and saying, it's okay, and I want you to, to have this expectation that you can say, mom, dad, I'm frustrated right now. Mm-hmm. So a good time to teach your kids how to verbalize what they're thinking or how they're feeling at this time. And to have that trust there to be able to do that for you. As you will say to them, I'm going to use Lane as an example because I, I, I know Lane and his, his name, because his name is up here. Okay, Brandy. So I'm just going to say, Brandy would say, you know, Lane, I'm a little frustrated right now. So um, I need a five minute break. Mm-hmm. And you model that with them. Yeah. So setting these expectations like I will communicate with you when I am frustrated. Um, we, we agree to communicate with each other when we're frustrated. We agree to have a daily meeting where we talk about our, um, have tos and want tos. We agree. So the expectations, um, yeah, go ahead. Like Shay, when, you know, when teachers have their first, they welcome their kids in the fall, yep. the class, they do that, right? They say, what should yeah. the classroom be? And the kids yeah. get to say some, and if, if the kids mm-hmm. don't come up with all of them, the teacher probably guides them to. Yeah, there's there's a little, fun, you know. And what do you think? Yeah. And they kind of set those norms in a way that that works for them. You're yeah. saying do that for your home too. Yeah, and they can't be the same at school because um, in in a in a classroom, some can be similar. Like I will agree to put my best foot forward, you know, mm-hmm. to to do my best work when I'm during school time. Um, that would be one that you may see, you know. The, I will do my best is sometimes one that you know kids come up with at, at school, and uh, and and you you can use that one. But then there are also ones like um, you know uh, I mean I get we need to have this in our home like keep your hands to yourself you know so they're not hitting their siblings and things like that. But um, I mean more specifically just whatever expectations you feel are um, are helpful to developing a positive mindset for this type, this transition, this new environment in our home. Um, And it's different for everybody. You know, classrooms can have a more consistency and and by nature have to just because we're accommodating, you know, 20, 30 kids, you can mix it up. You can be creative. You can figure out what works for your family and what works for your children um, Mm -hmm. during this time. But to have those expectations and be clear about it, write them out, post them. Yep. Write them out and post them. I think that's a conversation. Write them mm-hmm. out, post them. They have to have yeah. input into these things if they're going to yeah. buy into them. Remember, yeah. parents, as you come in and kids are like, you know, you're trying to control the situation. Whenever you exert control, you're going to get resistance mm-hmm. back. That's not mm-hmm. not to say you can't ever have control, but just, just understand that compliance is increased when children feel like they have a say when they are being heard. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. um, let's, I think that's a really good segue though yeah. to Michelle's question about sleep. And she says, what are your suggestions about the sleep schedule? Should I keep it the same as if they're in school? Can I have them stay up a little bit later as needed? You know, 
my suggestion on this, Shane, is kind of what, what we just talked about. Like, this is a time where you get to do something unique with your family. So if if your child is the kind of child that really needs that really consistent structure and schedule, then have them go to, you know, have them go to bed right. at the regular time. But, you know, right now there are no such things as weekends or weekdays or <laughs> like it's yeah. all blending yeah. together and we can't go anywhere. So if you end up staying up and watching a movie one night and your child can tolerate that, yeah. right? Or you end up having a family we night and it ends up being 10 o'clock or 1030 or whatever and everyone's enjoying themselves. I would not, if your child can tolerate that, I would not say not to do that. I would say, yeah. right, yeah. sleep yeah. the next day, call that a Friday night, even if it's yeah. Tuesday. Like, that's kind of, I don't know, that's my. Yeah, and that's why I had said like I, looking, yes, I agree. And that's why I had said like looking at the, whatever the schools are sending out, like I know some are doing packets, some are doing online learning. Um, what is it that you have to do that week? Um, I, I have taught in the virtual world for nine years. I, I think I shared this at the beginning that I um, I actually developed, built, implemented the first elementary virtual program in the state of Florida for a district um, that went from 12 kids to 72 to a couple hundred. So um, I have a lot of experience with this and working with families on how to individualize that in your home. And so this question comes up a lot, like it, it, it's right back to what works for your family. If you have a child, but it doesn't matter even on Saturday night, if they stay up until two o'clock in the morning and then they're gonna wake up on Saturday morning or Sunday morning at 6 a.m. and they're just gonna be a, you know, a holy terror the rest of the day. Yeah. Then you never want them staying up till two o'clock in the morning, right? It's the same kind of concept here. Um, not to worry so much about oh, Monday through Friday, you know, we have to do this, the school schedule. Um, lots of educators would argue with me on that, but I'm not like a lot of educators. So um, I'm more about if that's I'm just not, um, uh, you know, just like with Erin, if that, first of all, your kids are going to grow up. Trust me, I have a 19 year old that it went by super fast. And if I could go back and enjoy a wee night, I would not care if he skipped school the next day because they grow up and they leave <laughs> and, and, and they do, and they start their own lives. And um, those are precious moments. This is a time to enjoy those precious moments. And that's why I said in the beginning, if your kid misses one day of in instruction, it's not the end of the world. Um, it, you know, it, it's going to be okay. Um, and so to that, it do what works with your child and what works with your family. Um, and you know what that is, your moms and dads, I don't know if we have any dads in here watching, but your moms and dads, your parents in general, and you know, if you just, just sit at rest and watch and observe and think, you will see exactly what your kids need and they will tell you, you just have to be able to be aware and listen and see, and they will tell you exactly what they need and what works for them. Mm -hmm. it's They're so not gonna say, hey mom, I'm, you know, this is what I need, they're going to display happiness, peace, compliance, or they're going to display <laughs> meltdown, yelling, tantrum, uh, shutdown, um, you know, and, and if you watch, you'll see all those triggers ahead of time. So yes, enjoy yeah. this time with your, yeah. with your kids. Yeah. They, yeah. If, what else, like there have to be silver linings in all of this yeah. and, um, yeah. And yeah, when I said tolerate, when I said if your child can tolerate, so yeah, that's what yeah. I, if your child yeah. stays up late and they miss one hour of sleep, because honestly, the other thing to acknowledge is that mm -hmm. sleep is incredibly important for kids mm -hmm. to be. Oh yeah. It's so, incredibly important for everyone's. For everybody. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And it impacts your executive function. So if you have a child mm -hmm. who's already tantruming a lot and you have a child who can't manage time and can't manage their emotions, allowing them to become sleep deprived over multiple nights, right, is likely going to exacerbate the situation. Mm -hmm. But if you are someone who says, you know, I'm going to let them stay up a little bit later, and then I'm we're just going to have an easier day tomorrow, or I'm going to lower my expectations mm -hmm. and go to bed early tomorrow night. You, and like, 
like she said, you know, as parents, you do know, we have learned how to second guess ourselves so mm -hmm. incredibly much, but we know this. And so, um, yeah, just listen to what your kiddos are saying and, and remember to prioritize joy and bonding and, and experiences. So, yeah. And I just want to throw this out there. I'm not sure how many of you have read the whole brain child. Have you read this? Have you read the whole brain mm -hmm. child? Yeah. If you have not read that book, um, I please read it. Please take some time to to read it. There there are some good things in there uh, to learn about how everybody's brain works. It's not just the child's brain. I mean, I know they focus on that, but you'll learn a lot about yourself as well. And I think this is a good time to to read that while you are actually um, you know immersed in this time with your children at home with fewer distractions from our outside world, meaning places to go and things to do. Uh, it's yeah. a really, really good time to do some self-reflection. And, and that's a good book. I, I don't, I'm not plugging that for any reason other than I think it's a good book. Um, oh, we've done a book club on it. It's um, Dr. Dan Siegel is who it is. He also has one for those of you who have teens and he mm -hmm. characterizes teens, I think at the age of 12 to 24. Um, the, it's called brainstorm and it's a really great book about, um, what happens to yeah. your child's brain during that kind of emerging and adolescent, emerging adolescent and adolescent time. Yeah. Um, great for your kids because they, it's, yeah, it's amazing to understand. Um, I taught middle school for many years and there are a lot of people that teach this age kid and they do not understand what is going on in their brain. And because they don't understand the interaction uh, becomes negative rather than positive because they are not really grasping what's happening in that teen's brain. And they there have been um, physical studies done, images taken that it is a complete metamorphosis going on in your child's brain from the, that age time. It is physically changing shape and form. And therefore it is not functioning like our brain is. No, it doesn't and so, function like adult and it doesn't no. Other. like it is neither no, no and it's and it's ever changing so yes very very good very good books to read at this time since you are having to really interact a lot more in a different dynamic with your children yeah and i love that i love that book for teens because there are really great chapters and snippets that they can read and once they too get insight mm -hmm. into like my son just as an example he's angry right now he's so much angrier than he's ever been his anger kind of like sits right below the surface and i'm like honey we're just starting puberty this is you know what this is about right now and he, when he starts to learn about it he can understand that feeling and dismiss it a little more instead of getting frightened by it like oh okay this is kind of normal i'm going to move on you know so anyway, um, I think we are just about out of time. Computer's about to die. So I'm, I'm walking to the to the charger if I can find it here. <laughs> That's okay. If you die on us, um, okay. I will your links and stuff. But tell everybody where they can. Um, we went super long today. Tell everybody where they can okay. meet you. Okay. Um, yeah. You can find me on Facebook. At, uh, I am actually in the the group, the this group. Obviously, um, I pop in from time to time and answer your questions. So. You can find me there, uh, EliteEducationConsulting.com. I don't know why that's not in there. I'll just, put, I'll just do it right here. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can you can find me there or Shay Downey with Elite Education Consulting. I'm on Facebook as well. Awesome. And they have you have some freebies on there yeah. people can sign up for. You have some ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do. I, I am probably going to be adding some new freebies. Uh, I'm working on something for this time period, such as my, you know, five tips that uh, can help you and some sample ideas of, um, you know, sample, sample ideas of schedules and things like that that are not uh, as rigid. I know I keep using that word, but just really aren't as rigid as some of the things that I, that I'm seeing come out on Facebook and, and Instagram and um, just, you know, be careful with those, those things of trying to compare. I, I so encourage you to think about what works for your child. It, it really is a great time to be individual. It's not, you know, it's, this is not compare time. And it doesn't mean that you can't converse with other parents and see what works for them and try and see if it works for you. But don't feel like you're in a competition and you have to have the, you know, all of this perfect stuff that's coming out. That's, that's oh, my best. Cut yourself in yeah. Yeah. 
do so much self judging. If that mom's doing yeah. this, I would be doing this. No, actually, yeah. that mom's yeah. probably not even doing that. She's just posting yeah. it. Right. <laughs> like, so, like she's been posting, posting way too much on social media to be actually working with her kids. Exactly. <laughs> that chart looks way too pretty to actually yeah, have a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have my dog now joining in with what's going on with me. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Um, I'm going to let everybody go. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we will talk to you next month. Who knows what we'll be talking about next month. I know. I know I'm excited. We'll have play, you guys have questions, so I'm happy to answer if it's you know, my child, even if it's things like I'm struggling that I'm realizing they're struggling and reading more than I thought, what is something I can do for them? I'm happy to help you with some of those suggestions and kind of cut through a lot of the noise that's out there saying, try this, try this, try this. Um, you know, I can help cut some of that out and save you some time. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Have a great day. All right. Bye, Shay. Bye.